Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the house of the Lord today. Very beautiful on the outside, very comfortable here on the inside, and we appreciate you being here. We welcome any visitor that might be visiting with us. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the coming hour we can be a blessing to you. I want you to turn out about three different places in your Bible. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 21, Ephesians chapter 4, and 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm speaking to you today on this subject, Philip as an evangelist. I want us to see here how that he ministered as an evangelist, what he did and how he won souls and so forth. And we can profit from what we find about Philip and the evangelist. Reading first of all from Acts chapter 21. I want you to turn there, will you please? Acts chapter 21. And it's page 1178 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. There's a preacher met one of his little members, little boy in his church some time ago and said to him, said, son, have you prayed today? He said, no, sir. Said, I don't need something every day. So he figured the only time that he prayed is when he needed something. You know, you have a lot of church members like that, but the only time they pray is when they in need or want something. He said he hadn't prayed because he didn't want anything that particular day. But we need to pray every day, and the Bible says go in the attitude of prayer. In Acts chapter 21 and verse 8, And the next day we that were Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Now, if you notice, this scripture tells us here that Philip was an evangelist. And the Bible also said he was one of the seven, that is, one of the seven men chosen in the early church that to minister. Now, turn, will you please, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I want us to take a look at verse 11. It's page 1253. And the original Schofield Reference Bible, page 1253, and look at verse 11, Ephesians 4. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. See, the Holy Spirit does that. That's, they're given to the church for the ministry. They tell us about. Now turn, would you please, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's page 1281, 2 Timothy chapter 4, page 1281. And I want you to look at a verse of scripture found there. Look at verse 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Now Paul is telling young Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. Now, this man, Philip, here was a God-called, God-sent evangelist. And there's several things I want to say about him today that I hope will be a help to us. Remember, God called some apostles. We don't have any more of those today. After uh, the last ones passed on, then uh, that is, of the 12 apostles, then we don't have any more. God never called any more apostles. Paul was the last one. He was one born out of due season. And then, of course, the prophets... A man that God called and still has some today in the ministry. But the office of the prophet has been discontinued. When God finished the, giving the revelation of the Bible, then the office uh, deceased, that is, it diminished. And then, of course, the prophet is still alive today that uh, fourth tells the word of God. Not fourth tale, but fourth tale. He tells the future as found in the Bible. And he's not receiving any new revelations. But we do have the prophet. There's some in the land today that 
expound the scriptures, call people back to God, expose the sin of people and towns and villages and nations. And then, of course, we have the evangelists. Now we have some of them today in the ministry. They're God-given to the ministry. We thank God for them. And then you have the pastor. Of course, he's the man that pastors the flock. And then we have, of course, the teacher. Now the pastor should be up to teach or qualified to teach. But you also have gifted Bible teachers that have a great knowledge of the scriptures and their ministry is Bible teaching. And we thank God for those great men. But today, I want us to deal all together with the evangelist. Now there's several things about him I want to point out. Now, number one, Philip first proved himself in loyal service in the local church. If you read Acts chapter 6 and the first six verses, you will find there that he was appointed in the local church there in Jerusalem to serve as one of the deacons. And he was loyal in that service. He gave himself to that calling or that ability that God gave him in the position that he was appointed to because the Bible said if a man that's a deacon will serve in his local church faithfully, he's added himself a good degree and great favor, and that means he'd be rewarded for that particular work at the judgment seat of Christ. Deacons in the church have a great responsibility. They have a great opportunity, and they are great help to the church and to God's man as he pastors the church. We thank God for good deacons that serve well in the house of God and the work of the Lord. They'd be glad that they did when they come to the end of life's journey. Now he had three qualities used in the local church there when he was first called into this part of his ministry as being a deacon. Number one, he was a man of an honest report. He was an honest man. He believed in doing that which was honest and upright. He had a good reputation, a good name in this respect. Every deacon ought to be an honest man. A man that's true and honest in every respect. Not only that, but he was full of the Holy Ghost. This man, Philip, was filled with God's Spirit, full of the Holy Ghost, day after day, and ministered well in his capacity as a deacon there in the early church. That was a great honor. And it's a great honor for any man to be chosen to be a deacon in his church, in the local church where he serves God. Now we need good men. We need good deacons. They're great help to the pastor. They're great help to the church. And we thank God for them. Number two, Philip used adverse circumstances for the furtherance of the gospel. Now when things came along that caused him trouble and heartache and disappointment and persecution problems, he didn't fold up like an accordion and say, I'm going home to mama and I won't serve anymore. He didn't say that. These adverse circumstances gave him an opportunity to do things for God. And the same thing can be applied to our lives. Now we notice in Acts chapter 1 and the first four verses, there was great persecution in the church there in Jerusalem. Now God allowed this persecution. You may say, now, preacher, Edwards, why did God allow persecution to come to his people there in Jerusalem? The reason God allowed that is because that was a way to get them scattered and get them moving out in different directions, witnessing and carrying the gospel. And everything run along smoothly there in Jerusalem, and they had no opposition from the devil and no persecution. They'd have probably just gone to church every Sunday and met for prayer each day or whatever the occasion might have been and shouted the victory and enjoyed the blessings of God and never gone out to spread the gospel. Now God wanted the gospel spread out over the known world. When God sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and organized the church into a body there and established the first independent missionary Baptist church there in Jerusalem, God intended for them to go out from there and carry the gospel. And if they hang around there very long, they wouldn't be doing that. And so God allowed persecution to come from the outside, from the devil, to scatter them. And they began to scatter and go in every direction, but they held true to their testimony and went forth as great witnesses and went forth as preachers and missionaries carrying the gospel out to different places in the known world at that time. 
Great persecution came. Read Acts chapter 8 and the first four verses. And then we saw that something else happened to Philip. Not only was he persecuted and probably driven out of Jerusalem, but he preached to the Samaritans. Now that was one of the hardest fields to preach to because the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans and the Samaritans hated the Jews. Now you're talking about a hard field. I've heard preachers complain about their field being hard and we all do that. It seemed like in some territories it's harder than others. And so Philip would have a legitimate complaint here in Samaria about his field being hard. But he went there as an evangelist and preached a hard group of people to win over. They were half Jew and half Assyrian. And for that reason, the Jews had no dealings with them and they had no dealings with the Jews, of course. In John chapter 4 and verse 9, when Jesus went through Samaria and the woman at the well met him there as she came to draw water, she said the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. In fact, they would go all the way around Samaria when they went beyond there rather than to go through Samaria because they despised and hated that half-breed group of people, half Assyrian and half Jew. See, the, the Assyrians had come in there earlier and uh, captured Samaria and had intermarried among the Jews there. And there came those part Assyrians and part Jews across breed. And the real red-blooded, pure-blooded Jews hated those Samaritans. Now that's a kind of adversary or adversity, you might say, that Philip had in Samaria. But as an evangelist, he was willing to plow up the stumps and move right on and carry on for God. Now that's one of the characteristics of a great evangelist. They won't allow adversity, opposition, stop them. They'll go on and serve God anyway. I like to refer to the great uh, and late evangelist Oliver B. Green, one of the greatest evangelists has ever walked on the American continent. He's in heaven today, but many, many years ago, he and his music director, after World War II, went into Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, and there set up a big gospel tent to evangelize. He and his song leader went out and went to every pastor in town and invited them to come out and cooperate with them in the tent meeting. They only laughed at him and made light of him and said, no, we didn't invite you here. And we are not coming out to cooperate with you. You didn't ask us if you could come. And so you just go ahead and run your little business and we'll take care of ours. Well, Evangelist Green said to his song leader, he said, From here on, when God leads me to a town, we are not going to run around and beg these preachers to cooperate with us anymore. We'll set up the tent, we'll advertise the meeting, and we'll preach to those that come to the meeting, whether the preachers like it or not. And so during that tent meeting there in Rocky Mount, he had some 6,000 people saved. Some 6,000 professed their faith in that one, t one tent meeting. Shortly after the tent meeting, I went to Rocky Mount for a meeting myself. And just about everybody you ran into in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, had been saved under Evangelist Oliver Green's meeting. Now they wouldn't cooperate with him. They said, we didn't invite you here. You didn't ask us if you could come, and we're not going to work with you. But in spite of that, he went ahead and did what he knew God wanted him to do and had one of the greatest meetings that's ever come to that city. Now, this evangelist Philip here went down in Samaria. He had great opposition, great adversity, but he went on and preached the gospel. And notice what happened. A great revival broke out in Samaria. God moved on the scene. God began to convict those Samaritans. They began to repent and turn to God and get saved. And a real old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival broke out there in Samaria. But while Philip was there in the meeting, everything now seemed to be going along fine. God spoke to him and said, Philip, I want you as an evangelist to take a trip out into the, the desert, down toward Gazar." Or the guys are stripped to call it now. I want you to go and preach down in the desert. Now Philip had to go all the way back by Jerusalem. And then go down in the desert toward Gazar. In order to preach. But he did. We find in Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip saying. Arise and go toward the south on the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gazar. Which is desert. Now here the evangelist did not question God about this. 
He didn't say, now, Lord, I'm having a good time here in Samaria. We are having a revival. Souls are being saved. He didn't argue about it. No doubt there's a question came to his mouth. Why should I go way down into a desert to preach? But he said God sent him down there, so he didn't ask any questions about it. And so he went. Now he was persecuted in Jerusalem. He had great opposition in Samaria. And now he's to go into the desert. He was still obedient to God. Now notice number three that Philip was prompted, uh, prompted his obedience to God. Notice what happened when he obeyed God. Notice what prompted him to do it in Acts chapter 8 verses 26 and 27. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, said, Arise and go toward the south into the way that goeth down to Jerusalem and Gaza, which is desert. He rose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, a eunuch of great authority that had charge of the business affairs of the queen there in Ethiopia, was coming back from Jerusalem, headed back home. And no doubt he had heard about the revival in Jerusalem. He had heard about Jesus. He would heard about the coming of the Spirit of God. And he saw just enough to kind of get him interested. And he was riding along in his chariot. And he was reading from the book of Isaiah. And he was reading from Isaiah chapter 53. Prophecy that has to do with Christ's first coming. And as he rode along, he read that scripture. And he wanted to know more about it. And so God sent Philip the evangelist down there to tell him about Jesus. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 20, verses 29 and 30, that the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him. Now this is a strange act indeed. God taking him out of Samaria where he's preaching to multitudes, sending him down into a desert to preach to one lone man riding a chariot down a dusty road. And that was his mission. God said, You go preach. Go preach to this man. And when he came near the, the caravan, there he saw one particular chariot that God singled out to him. And he said, now, Philip, you go and get in that chariot and tell that man what he wants to know. Now, Philip didn't run along by every chariot on the uh, dusty road and give out tracts. That's not what God called him to do at that particular time. Nothing wrong in giving out gospel tracts. But God said, you go. And joined to this particular chariot, and he ran. He ran and caught up with this chariot, and he crawled up in the chariot beside this man. And this man was reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Now, notice number four that is, Philip did not despise a day of small things. We are living in a day now when people look at big things. You have big shot of fans today, unless they can get. The promised cooperation of the entire association or a group of maybe many dozen ministers or more in the area uh, to cooperate with them and guarantee them large crowds. They won't come. They want to go where they can get the crowds and the most people to cooperate in the largest crowds. And they don't like the day of small things. But we find that Philip did not despise the day of small things. And referring back to late Oliver B. Green, one great outstanding characteristic of that great man of God was back when he was doing church meetings, when he was not doing his tent revivals, uh, he would take churches and call none of them. I don't care how small they were, he had, let, he had booked you for a meeting in your church if you was willing to wait for him. When I was pastoring down in Green County in the Bethel Baptist Church, I booked that man some five or six years in advance in order to get him. Now, he didn't say, now, preacher, uh, how big a church do you have? No, sir. He said, all right, if you want to wait for him. He called none of them. He took the little ones as well as the big ones, the wealth as well as the poor. It made no difference, and that's why God blessed that man. I can name another evangelist today, a couple more, unless they got at least $800,000 for a revival meeting a week. Then you couldn't get them. Now those men grieve the spirit of God and, and it's displeasing to God. And I invited the evangelist to my church seven years ago and he didn't know for sure what size church I had. And he asked somebody down in Augusta, said, could you tell me what size church Preach Edwards has there in Athens? He wanted to know the size of the church before he uh, committed himself to come. And when he found out we didn't have a thousand people in the church, he didn't give me the meeting. 
And I'm glad he didn't after I found out the kind of fellow he was. Because I don't want a man like that in the first place. I want God's man. Now Philip did not despise the day of small things. He went out and preached to a lone man in the desert. In Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 10, For who hath despised the day of small things, for they shall rejoice. Now Jesus did not despise small things. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20, He said, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Now Jesus did not say, If you have a local church of a thousand people, I'll come and be with you. He said, If two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. Beloved, a church with a dozen members is just as precious in the sight of God Almighty as a church with a thousand members. If you had the five children in your family and you had one that didn't seem to grow as well as the others and, and didn't seem to be able to be as tall, as tall in stature as others or maybe quite as healthy, would you love that child any less? No, you would not. Chances are your heart would go out to that child because that child not quite as fortunate as maybe some of the other members of the family. Now God loves the churches and the size of the church makes no difference. God loves the small local assembly as much as he loves the large one. God doesn't despise that they are small things. When Jesus there taught the, a priest the woman at the well, there's only one. One woman he preached to her. When Nicodemus came to pay him a visit, there's only one. He preached to him. And so Philip went down into the desert and preached to one lone Ethiopian eunuch. Now the Bible, or rather tradition tells us, that after that man is saved, he drove all the way down to Ethiopia, telling people about Jesus, and was used of God down there to start some churches in Ethiopia. So you see the day of small things we should not be despised. When this Mr. Kimball, a little Sunday school teacher, walked into a shoe store, saw a little boy about 16 years old there selling shoes. He was a clerk there in the store. He'd visited his Sunday school class. And he told that boy about Jesus and warned that boy to God. And then he left. And that boy walked out of that uh, shoe store. And there went down the street praising God and said, Even the sun was shining for me. The birds sang for him, seemed like. And that boy was none other than Dwight L. Moody. And Dwight L. Moody robbed hell of over a million souls. Kimball did not despise a day of small things. Now you never know when you win one person of God what might be the ultimate outcome of just one person one to Jesus Christ. That's what happened here. And so this good evangelist did not fuss about it. He did not growl about the, growl about the crowds. He did not say you'll have to give me a certain amount of offering to come. He went all the way down in that desert and preached to one lone man. That's exactly what God wanted him to do. Now God wants us to be faithful with his small or large and not despise that they are small things. Number five, for Philip evangelizing was preaching Christ. If you read Acts chapter, five, eight, chapter 8 verses 5 through 8, you find there the Bible said that Philip preached Jesus to him. In verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth, beginning the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. Evangelizing, for this evangelist was preaching Jesus. And it should be the same way today. God didn't tell us to go out and put on a carnival or some kind of show or some kind of entertaining program to draw crowds. He said for us to go and preach Jesus Christ. Preach the word of God. If you don't have it a dozen, all right. If you have 2,000, all right. Preach the word of God. Now, Philip didn't go down and say, now we're going to put on some kind of entertainment um, program. I got a man coming down with some puppets, and they're going to, are we going to show them? And then we're going to give out some hamburgers and hot dogs, and, and we're going to give out a lot of gimmicks and draw us a crowd and, and have a wonderful meeting. No, no. God said you go down that desert and preach to that man. And he went down and preached to that lone man. A lost sheep is found in the wilderness, the Bible tells us. And living waters spring up in the desert. And that's what happened there. Now we need to realize that we need to preach, be faithful in season, out of season. That's the fact that went into a town one day, checked into the hotel, wrote a letter he wanted to mail, and started down to the post office. Saw a newsboy standing on the corner and he said, Sonny boy, I said, you know who I am? The young boy said, no, sir, I sure don't. 
He said, I'm the evangelist. I just come here for a meeting and I'm staying down here in the hotel. He said, can you tell me where the post office is around here? He said, yes, sir. He directed him how to get to the post office. And then when he got ready to leave, the evangelist said, Sonny boy, I said, if you'll come down to the church tonight, I'll tell you how to get to heaven. Young boy looked at him and said, a man that don't know how to get to the post office surely wouldn't know how to get to heaven. He said, I won't bother about it. And he went on about his business. Now, in dealing with individuals, Philip found out where this man stood. Now, when doctors, they diagnose your situation, you go to his office or wherever you meet the doctor. He'll ask you some questions. He'll take your pulse, your temperature and whatnot. And there he's going to check you out and find out where you stand and what your problem is. Now, when we're dealing with sinners, we should be even more concerned than a doctor would be about dealing with your physical welfare because we are dealing with a man's spiritual welfare as to where he'll spend eternity. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 30, Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Now this evangelist looked at this a man, this Ethiopian youth, and said, Do you understand what you're reading here, sir, from that script you have? He said, No, sir. Now we know that Philip then questioned him about it and began to explain unto him the matter of salvation and telling him this prophecy was pertaining to Jesus. Philip brought his man to an open declaration of faith in Christ. If you read Acts chapter 35 verse 38, you'll find there that he wanted to be sure that this man understood that he was lost, that this scripture had to do with the coming Messiah, and the Messiah had already come, and he'd been crucified, buried, and risen again, and the Holy Spirit had come, and now he must believe this and accept this in order to be saved. And he took the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So in dealing with humanity, we need to be careful how we deal with them and not let them stop short of salvation, thinking they're saved and die and go to hell and their blood will be on our hands. This little shallow believism today and turn over a new leaf is not worth a dime with a hole in it. We need to reach the hearts and minds of people and let them know they're lost and tell them about God and get them born again. Now notice not only that, move on to another thought, and that is Philip was given to hospitality. He was not a man that was a tight ward, a penny preacher, a nickel nibber. He was a man that was liberal in the matter of, of giving out contributions and so forth. The Bible says in Acts chapter 21 and verse 8, the next day, we who were Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea. We entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was of the seven, and abode with him. When Paul and his party came through here, Philip heard about it, invited them in his home, and fed them, and took care of them as long as he needed to do so. He was given to hospitality. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of bishop, he desire a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Given to hospitality. A preacher, a minister, should be a man given to hospitality. The late Joe Parsons, many of you know him, that uh, spent many years in evangelism, and his last home was in Anderson, South Carolina, I remember back in his early years of his ministry when he was in his middle 30s, I never heard a man preach with such power. In those days, it was days of uh, famine and, and days of poverty and, and you could hardly make enough money to live on and hardly get enough food to eat. And Joe Parson many times would go to the little churches and run a revival. And they couldn't give much offering in those days. Maybe they'd give him $25, 15 or $25. And on the way back home, if he met somebody hungry, or he saw some children need clothing, or he saw someone is in hell, he very seldom ever reached back home with that money. Many times he'd give every penny of it away before he got back home. He was a man given into hospitality, and he loved people, wanted to help people, and he had great power with God. I never heard a man except one other fellow that preached with the power that that man had in those days. Man given to hospitality. Many years ago, there's a woman yonder in London, England that died, and they had a body there, of course, for people to view it. And even uh, guests and, 
And servants from the home of the house of the, the princess would came down and paid this woman a visit. And then the lords of England, many of them came by and lifted her body lying there in the coffin. And then there came a poor woman with a, a kind of a worn out shawl and then a worn out dress. And they knew she was very poor. And she came down and she stood in front of that coffin and just stood there looking at that woman and began to weep. And she just kept standing there. She was a push to the poor. Some of the people waiting in line to come by to see this lady lying in the coffin said, I wish that woman would move on out of the way, but she just kept standing there looking and weeping. Finally, someone came and said, Lady, said, would you move on so the rest of us could take a look at this lady here? She began to cry. She said, I walked 40 miles to come see this woman's body. Said, the reason I did that, said, this woman led my children to Jesus Christ, and they're living for God. And that woman lying in that casket was none other than uh, Catherine Booth, the wife of the man that founded the Salvation Army, William Booth. There she had been such a great blessing that this poor woman couldn't leave. She had won her children to God. She had walked 40 miles to see a body. And when they found out why she did it, it stood there weeping. They all joined in and wept with her. Because Catherine Booth was such a great woman and did so many great things for God in her day. And she and her husband founded the Salvation Army that's in operation since that, been in operation since that time. Now finally, Philip the Evangelist brought joy wherever he went. If you read Acts chapter 5 and verse 8, uh, chapter 8 rather, verses 5 through 8, you find while he preached there in Samaritan, God saved souls. People begin to shout the victory and praise God. Look at verse 39 of Acts 8. And when they were come up out of the water, the, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Here, the man he watered the desert went away shouting, praising God and rejoicing. Down in Samaria, they shouted, praise God and rejoice through this man's ministry. In John chapter 15 and verse 11, these things I've spoken to you that your joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. That my joy might remain in you and your joy be full. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, the Bible said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I say again, rejoice. Here is a man that was a true evangelist. And everywhere he went, he brought joy. Now let that sink in. Everywhere he went preaching, he brought joy. If there's ever a generation of people that need some true joy today, it's God's people, and even people of this world, trying to satisfy themselves with the evils of this world to get on a high or get a little joy when they find the real joy in knowing Christ. Philip, the great evangelist, brought great joy. Have you ever brought joy to anyone by serving the Lord faithfully? God wants you to, and you can. Let's stand our feet. Our Father, I pray today in Jesus' name that You'll take the message and use it. Thank you for the great evangelists we have in the land and those that's served in years gone by. Lord, help us to be like Philip and not despise the day of small things. Lord, if we just witness to one person, get one person saved, heaven alone knows what would be the ultimate result of that. Help us to bring joy to somebody, our Father, as we sojourn like the man Philip did in his day. Speak to this people as we give the invitation in Christ's name. Amen. Now as Debbie plays for us, if you're here today and you need to come to the Lord or want to get saved or come back to God or join the church or come forward for some reason or other, while she plays a couple of standards, would you come? Would you come while we wait? If God is speaking to you, if you want to join the church, by letter, by statement, the for baptism, any way you want to come, just come right ahead. We'll wait on you. We'll help you. I'm going to ask you to come down here and give her a speech. I just come down and present yourself. I'll take over from there. You do what God tells you to do. As we preach and as we wait, would you come? Through one of the stanzas. Come.